Ladies and gentlemen, dear students, welcome to the 11th week of Eco Astronomy Sri Lanka Advanced Lecture Series. And tonight, we are honored and humbled to have with us the Executive Director of Mars Society, Mr. James Burke. He is known by his devotion and gorgeous epic achievements. Mr. Burke, he's going to give us a lecture tonight about space advocacy and human mission to Mars. Mr. Burke, the floor is yours. You can get started. Thank you so much, Maja. Thank you very much for inviting me slides and let me know if you guys see that. It's going to be. I don't okay, yeah. okay. Did you on to Mars and so forget everything going on in the world and all the troubles you, you have, all the things you're worried about, and just focus on a journey to Mars and a journey into the future. Um. So what I'm showing you right now is what Mars would look like if we were in a spacecraft about to, you know, to land. Um, that's the sort of a, a true image of Mars taken from the Hubble Space Telescope. And you can see right away that Mars has a lot of things, um, a bit of an atmosphere there, planet. You can tell that the uh, what looks like ice on the, um, you know, we used to think that it was all carbon dioxide ice, but now we're pretty, cl it's pretty clear to us that there's a lot of water on Mars locked up in ice uh, on the, in the poles and also underneath the surface. But, you know, this is what Mars would look like if you were approaching it from a spacecraft. And let me talk a little bit about Mars, the, the planet, and why it's such a great destination for us to go. So Mars, like the Earth, um, has natural gravity. Mars is about half the size of the Earth. But because Mars does not have any liquid oceans like the Earth, Mars actually has the same surface area as all of the Earth's land. So if you add up all the land on the Earth, Mars is about the same surface area. Um, Mars has 38% of the gravity of Earth, which is actually better than the moon. The moon only has 16%. So um, unlike, you know, going to the International Space Station or other destinations, you know, you don't have to make your own gravity or you don't have to deal with zero gravity and, and its effects on the human body by going to Mars. You have natural gravity there. Mars day is 24 hours and 39 and a half minutes. So very similar to the Earth. And Mars also has seasons like the Earth. Mars is, um, because it's farther away from the sun, it's, a year on Mars is longer than the Earth. It's about 1.8 Earth years. And because the atmosphere is much thinner on Mars than the Earth, it's colder. So usually it's below zero on Mars, but it does actually warm up sometimes to about zero uh, degrees Celsius. The atmosphere as I mentioned, is thinner. It's about one one thousandth of the Earth's atmosphere, and it's mostly carbon dioxide, but there's some traces of nitrogen and oxygen and argon, and also, interestingly, methane. There's a little bit of methane on Mars, which we speculate may be due to biological processes that we don't understand yet. Um, the reason Mars is red is because of the iron oxide. That's the dust everywhere on Mars. Mars is basically a rusty planet. And um, as I mentioned, wa wa Mars has water ice on the caps, the polar caps. But also, there's a lot of places on Mars where ice is just underneath the surface. And so there's a lot of former lakes on Mars, former seas. So depending on where we send people, it's it's not going to be that hard to, to find water and, and start using that for the, the humans that are living there. Um, Mars, some features of Mars. Mars is a Grand Canyon that's as long and as wide as the entire United States. It's a huge Grand Canyon. It's called Valles Marineris. 
It has the tallest mountain on the solar system, Olympus Mons, which is a shield volcano, um, kind of like the Hawaiian Islands, that type of volcano. It's a, like a, a tall and wide volcano. Um, Mars has two small moons, Phobos and Deimos, which are actually captured asteroids. They're a lot smaller relative to Mars than our moon the, is relative to Earth. Um, so, the, you know, our moon was formed by what was likely a collision with another world and a part of the Earth's core came, you know, kind of spat out of the Earth and created the moon. Whereas Mars, two moons are captured asteroids. So they were not formed along with the planet. And Mars, um, the reason Mars is so cold and the air is so thin is because it lost its magnetic field. So the Earth is, you know, we have a really robust magnetic field that's created by our rotating iron core of the planet. And that's what protects us from the sun's radiation and it keeps our atmosphere in place. And so Mars lost that. Mars once had a magnetic field, but it lost that and that's how it lost its atmosphere. And, and you know, because Mars used to have a magnetic field and it, it, it had, it was a lot warmer than, Mars actually was an Earth-like planet. Um, about four, three to four billion years ago. So right when the Earth was forming and, and we were starting to, um, you know, cool off and life was starting to begin on Earth, Mars was a warm and wet planet. And so there's a lot of questions about what happened. Why did Mars lose its, its, its magnetic field and its atmosphere and become the cold and dusty planet that it is today? And that's one of the things that drive a lot of the science missions that are sent to Mars is understanding what happened to Mars and why why was it a warm and wet planet before and now it isn't? And could that be our fate as well? You know, and that's one of the reasons why we, we go and explore space is to understand, you know, what happened to Mars, what happened, you know, what's happening on Venus. Venus has a runaway greenhouse effect. So if we're not careful on Earth, if we if we pollute the atmosphere. We can end up we can end up like Venus, which would be not a good not a good thing for humans. So so that's a little bit about Mars. Um, why would we want to send people to Mars? That's kind of a crazy idea, right? You know, why would you send people to a, a place that they can't breathe, and the gravity's less, and it's cold? And they're going to have to find shelter. They're going to have to build habitats and maybe live underground. Why would you want to do that? Well, there's a lot of reasons to send people to Mars, actually. Um, the number one reason, you can kind of think of it as fear. Like if we stay on Earth, if, you know, there's basically two different human futures from today. We can either go out and explore space and become a spacefaring civilization and settle Mars and go out to all the other planets and moons of the solar system and, and settle them with humans and we have this really vibrant spacefaring society where we're traveling among the planets and among the stars that's one possible future the other possible future is we never do that we never get our stuff together and we never leave earth and we you know fight over the scraps of what's left on earth as more people are born and there's less land and less housing and less resources and we we never find a way to leave earth and we all someday get hit by an asteroid and we all die and the human race is dead that's not a future i believe in um i believe in the first future i believe that we're going to go out and settle space and have a future of abundance and a future where you know life is better on earth because we're exploring space and because we're understanding the other planets and we're utilizing all the resources of the solar system and we're learning beyond the solar system how to travel to other stars and really spread out amongst uh, our part of the galaxy. That's the future I believe in and I hope that's a future you can get behind as well. But if you believe in that future of a positive human future of exploring space, then the best place to go learn how to do that is Mars. Um, unlike all the other destinations in the solar system, you know, things like the moons of Jupiter and Saturn and our moon, unlike all those other places, 
Mars has, is uniquely suited to, to support human beings. Mars has natural gravity. It has abundant resources. You know, I mentioned water a couple times. That's going to be a key asset for us to utilize to um, not only for water for our bodies to use, but also we can split off the oxygen and breathe that um, to sustain ourselves. We can use water to grow plants and we could use water to make other things. Um, you can actually take um, the hydrogen that's in water and react it with the carbon dioxide on the in the Martian air and make methane, make CH4, and that's rocket fuel. Um, so you can actually make rocket fuel on Mars based on the resources that are already on Mars. Um, Mars also has a 24-hour day, like I mentioned, it's 24 hours and 39 and a half minutes. Well, that's pretty close to Earth. That's pretty close to the circadian cycles that human beings have. And so, um, you know, and the fact that Mars has seasons too, like that would be a way for us to acclimate to living there. That would help us. Uh, Mars also has geothermal energy sources that we could tap into to make power. And so there's a lot of reasons to send people to Mars. The one I like to talk about too is just the challenge of it that human beings need challenges and we're explorers and we need to you know always be growing and settling mars and trying to open up mars as a second home planet for humanity would be a huge challenge and it would inspire people so um so those are all the reasons uh, and then the, the last reason is if you believe that we're going to do this someday if you believe that we are going to settle mars and there's going to be people born on mars um, and they're going to have a whole other branch of human civilization. If you believe that is the case, then we should go do it for them. We should go do it for all those people that have yet to be born. We should go do it for the Martians. So let me talk a little bit about the past exploration that we've done up to today of Mars. So this chart here has all the different missions that have happened, all the different robotic missions that have been attempted to be sent to Mars since the beginning of the space era in the 1960s. And as you can see, if you look at the results there, the X's and the check boxes there on the on sort of the middle to the bottom of this diagram, you can see that when things got started in the, in the top and then extending a, a, a counterclockwise, there were a lot of failures initially, you know, Russia and the Soviet Union sent a lot of probes to Mars, but a lot of them failed. In fact, all of them, all the ones that the Soviet Union ever sent failed. Um, the U.S. had a couple of successful flybys in the 60s with the Mariner 4 and 6 and 7 missions. And then Mariner 9 was the first orbiter mission that was successful. And it, so it actually orbited the planet successfully. And um, that's how we started really learning more about Mars. We were able to send back photos of Mars that showed that it was, you know, there's a lot of craters on Mars. There wasn't um, a, a, a deep atmosphere. So it actually disheartened a lot of the scientists back then because they thought that Mars might have, you know, been more of an Earth-like planet than it really was. But over the years, we've learned a lot, so much more about it than we initially knew then um, there's been a there's been several successful robotic uh, rover missions so starting with um, 1996's Mars Pathfinder which um, launched a very small rover called Sojourner to Mars that was successful and then there's been a string of successes by the United States with our rover uh, missions and so up to the present day we have the Curiosity rover um, but we also, there's been Spirit and Opportunity, Mars Exploration Rovers that lasted many years. Opportunity was only designed to last for uh, a few months, but ended up lasting for over 10 years exploring Mars. And the Curiosity and Perseverance Rovers that are the two most recent are so sophisticated and, and so large that they've, you know, been able to bring a lot of different science instruments to Mars to analyze the rocks and, and drill 
and Perseverance is even collecting samples that we're eventually going to send back to Earth to study. So, um, to this, you know, to this point, there's been a lot of successful Mars missions that have really paved the way for humans. And so we've learned a lot about how to land on Mars, you know, how to land small to medium sized payloads on Mars. And that's just going to help us with a human Mars program. So here's some of the rovers that were sent. Um, you can see the Mars Pathfinder rover in the top left. Um, that happened when I was in college, and so it was really an inspiring mission for me to follow. Um, and I well, later on got to meet a lot of the, the team that worked on that. Um, but you can see, like, we've had this sustained program of sending rovers to Mars that have had so many discoveries and landed on many different parts of the planet, different environments from the earliest um, mission uh, that landed in Aries Vallis and it was a very rocky mission there was you know the, the goal of the first Mars Pathfinder mission was to study rocks and so they tried, tried to pick a place that had a lot of rocks and they were successful it was an outflow channel that had a lot of rocks deposited by an ancient water flow to the present day where you have the Perseverance rover exploring Jezero crater which is a former river delta and could potentially be a place where life uh, existed in the past. And so one of the things that Perseverance is looking for are possible fossils and other evidence of past water and past life. So I talked about the Curiosity rover. Um, the way that we've landed rovers on Mars has changed a lot. Um, the first mission, uh, Pathfinder, and also the two, the next two Spirit and Opportunity, they essentially used a system to land that involved airbags. So they would have a the spacecraft would have airbags inflate around it, and it would sort of bounce around on the ground and then unfold. Whereas the more recent rovers are a lot bigger, and so they actually were delivered to Mars by something called a sky crane, and they it dropped off the rovers. On, on their wheels and then flew away. You can see that the rendering there for the Curiosity mission. And that's also the system that Perseverance used recently. And there's some spectacular video from the landing of Perseverance that you can see um, from the sky crane. You can see the rover landing. So that's really cool to see. And here's all the different instruments that are on Perseverance. Um, there's uh, what's really interesting to me is the MOXIE experiment, the Mars Oxygen ISRU experiment. That is essentially an experiment to prove that human beings could make oxygen from the Martian atmosphere and use it to breathe. So it's a pilot experiment done on a very small scale, but it's showing the viability of being able to take the Martian atmosphere and create oxygen that we could breathe. So very important for future human exploration. Also, uh, what happened recently uh, with the Perseverance mission is they landed the Mars helicopter on Mars and has have had several flights of it. And it's been a really amazing um, demonstration of technology to fly a helicopter on Mars. And it's gone so well that they're actually, you know, have. They've proven that the helicopter works and that you can fly a helicopter on Mars, and now they're using the helicopter to scout out new places for the rover to go and, and new sites that uh, future, future missions can explore as well. So the, the helicopter's really done a, a fantastic job and um, met all the criteria that they initially had for that technology demonstration. So um, that's been a great mission, and it's been really exciting to follow that. So beyond the U.S., though, there's been a lot of other countries that have recently launched Mars missions. And so, for example, India launched the Mars Orbiter mission a few years back, um, and they made some discoveries of the, the water in the atmosphere on Mars and measured the methane content in the atmosphere. What I really like about this mission, what inspires me about this mission, is most of the flight team was women. Most of the mission control staff were women. As you, you can see them in the bottom right here. And so um, 
this really inspired a lot of people across India to pursue um, STEM more fully and, and you know, you know, put Mars on the radar for a lot of people in India, and I think that was great. Um, also, China has been very active in, in launching Mars missions. They've had a few probes, and they actually have actually landed a rover as well. Um, so very exciting stuff. And then the Mars Hope mission by the United Arab Emirates also um, recently arrived on Mars. And so it's another example of an, a, a new country exploring Mars and um, making discoveries that uh, have never been made before. So it's really exciting to see all the international missions happening. Let's talk about what it would take to send humans from a technical perspective. I'm sure that's of interest to, to folks here. So what I'm showing you now is a slide from Robert Zubrin's Mars Direct presentation. So Robert Zubrin is the president of the Mars Society. That's the organization I work for. And he, he became famous in the 1990s because he came up with the idea of Mars Direct, of sending a mission to Mars that's as cheap and easy to do as possible, as lightweight and small as possible, and using the Martian resources uh, to leverage what you need to do the mission. So the idea with the Mars Direct plan is that you'd have a heavy lift rocket, you know, a rocket kind of like the size of the Apollo moon rocket, the Saturn V. And now we're seeing actually two different options for this. The, there's, a, there's one called the Space Launch System, the SLS which NASA has been working on and is gonna fly later this year for the first time. And it's derived from the space shuttle. And it looks very similar to this diagram. This diagram was made in the 1990s. And Robert essentially was using that design of a shuttle derived rocket to, to design this Mars mission. But the other option is Elon Musk's SpaceX um, is building a, a rocket called Starship. And Starship and its super super heavy booster are also an option for a, a Mars direct mission like this. So if you had a rocket such as those two, which we're about to have both of, um, you could use them to send a payload to Mars. Um, and the idea is that first, before you send people on a mission like this, you would first send an un, uncrewed cargo mission to establish the base on Mars that you're going to land on. And that's what the year one automated mission would be here on this diagram. So first you send out the um, return ship that you're going to use to come back to Earth, and you send it out unfueled. And remember I said how you could make methane on Mars if you uh, react the carbon dioxide in the air with hydrogen to make CH4? Well, that's what you would actually do. You would generate methane uh, on Mars from the local resources, and that would be the fuel to come home on this mission. That, that would be what you work on with the year one cargo. You land that on Mars, it would begin to generate the methane that you'd use to come home, and that after about a year, you would have your return ship ready for you, waiting on the surface of Mars, uh, fully, fully fueled and ready to go. And at that point, you could then send out humans. So in the next opportunity, so between Earth and Mars, we can launch a mission every 22 months. So roughly about every two years, there's a window where Earth and Mars are in the right alignment to send a crew or a mission to Mars. So in year three, you'd actually send two rockets this time. One would be the crew that you would land at the first site. And then the second rocket would be another automated rocket, another un unpiloted cargo mission to open up a second site on Mars. So essentially, you have a Mars program here with one launch, with an average of one launch a year, one heavy lift launch per year to have a sustained human Mars program where you're landing on multiple sites and exploring Mars. And that's the idea, this is Mars Direct, that's the idea that the Mars Society has been championing for you know, 25 years now. 
And so um, this type of program is very affordable, could fit within the existing NASA budget. And so um, we're just waiting for someone to, to, to go off and do this. And so along came Elon recently, and now they're actually working on you know, a, a mission cadence just like this with uh, the Starship rocket. And so essentially, um, we hope that Starship will be successful and go into orbit later this year and start paving the way for this type of human Mars program to, to happen. So I do believe it will happen in the next five to 10 years. Here's an example of what a Mars base would look like using this Mars Direct plan. So you, on the left, you have the spacecraft that's, um, that you took from Earth with, with the crew. So you have a crew of four to six people living there. And that's, they, you know, they've transitioned from Earth to Mars through space and they land that spacecraft on Mars and that becomes their habitat on Mars for the, for the year and a half that they're there. Um, on the far right, you can see the um, Earth return vehicle. That's the one that we sent out first. That's the one that we fully fueled with the Martian uh, atmosphere to make methane. And so that's our return ticket home when the mission's over. And you can see there's also things like a greenhouse and a pressurized rover and some solar panels to support the base. And so this would be a small landing site that people would live at for about a year and they would explore. They'd take the rover and go around and look at different uh, interesting things around that area, make discoveries, collect samples, and bring those back to Earth with them when they came home. And that's, that's essentially the vision of a, of a Mars base, of a, of a first Mars mission. But we wouldn't want to stop there. We would actually want to build permanent settlements as well. You know, this would be a good first mission or like you'd maybe do this type of architecture a few times, different sites on Mars, but eventually you'd want to build a permanent base. And so here's a concept of a permanent base on Mars where it's more um, created for a larger crew and a longer term stay. And this is actually something that could turn into a permanent settlement that people live at for multiple years. Um, so some of the features of this, you have a greenhouse where you're growing food, and it is possible to grow food on Mars if you take the Martian soil and add in some organics um, and take out the perchlorates that are in the soil. So, you know, it's, it's well understood that you can um, build a, a greenhouse like this on Mars and use it to supplement the food that, that the crew needs. And you have other things like a dome, you know, power stations and different uh, air tanks, and methane tanks. So this is a pretty good example of a, of a human settlement on Mars, a permanent one. And if you ever saw the movie The Martian, you know, you saw him learning how to live on Mars and how to grow plants. And that was a pretty accurate movie. Um, it came out in 2016. Uh, so we're really happy about that movie, and um, we, you know, we talk about that a lot at the Mars Society. Of that, that was a good vision of figuring out how to live on Mars and um, growing plants and dealing with some of the challenges you, you have. So definitely recommend watching that movie if you haven't seen it yet. But that brings now us to what we do at the Mars Society. Um, so this is actually this is not an artist rendering. This is actually a photo of our Mars Desert Research Station in Utah, in the United States. Um, and I was actually just there about two weeks ago. Um, and I can tell you, every time I go, it feels like I'm on Mars. Uh, it's a great analog environment. You know, we selected that area because it's very similar geologically to Mars. And we've built this facility. Um, it's about 20 years old now. And it simulates a um, that first landing site on Mars. So that building on the far right is called the HAB, and that's designed to be like a landed spacecraft. And when and we run this, um, this station year round, um, we have a field season that runs about nine months out of the year. We just finished up our most recent field season. So we had about a dozen crews that stayed. Each crew was about four to six people, and they all um, pretended to live and work on Mars. They 
you know, one of the mission rules are if you go outside, you have to wear a, a, a simulated spacesuit, so a helmet and backpack, and you can see the two analog astronauts there doing that. Um, and so it's a great experience. I, I've actually been through a, a crew mission myself at the MDRS back in 2018, and I really, uh, it was a really profound experience for me and it really got me in the mindset of what it would be like to live and work on Mars for a short time. So, um, so we, we do this research project uh, as the Mars Society because we want to show people that this is feasible, that this is not science fiction to live and work on Mars, that we actually can do it with today's technology and we practice the, the human factors and operational elements of doing that with our station in Utah. And here's another photo of our station more recently taken. And so, you know, you can see on the left there, that's the, the habitat. It's a two story building on the upper floor are six um, staterooms that the crew stays in as well as a common area and a kitchen. And that's sort of your, your home on Mars. And then on the lower deck, there's room for us to put on our spacesuits and do other um, lab experiments and research. In the middle there is the greenhouse um, where we grow plant experiments and grow food to supplement um, the crews. On the far right is the science dome. It's a half geodesic dome. It's a great uh, building and that's my favorite area of the campus. It's really spacious and it's air conditioned. Um, has a great view of the of the surrounding terrain. And then the Musk Observatory is in the kind of top middle um, there. That's a small um, observatory that we built after Elon Musk donated money to fund this project in 2002. Uh, it's now a sun observatory. We actually have a second observatory on campus called the Robotic Observatory. And because we're out in the middle of the desert in Utah, the skies at night are fantastic astronomy. And so we fully take advantage of that by having the two observatories. And you also can see on this uh, a couple of the vehicles we use to go around when we're both in simulation and also just preparing for one. There's some uh, Polaris EV rovers and some all-terrain vehicles that we that drive around the area. And so you can imagine wearing a space suit and driving those around could be quite fun. So this is the Mars Desert Research Station. We've been doing this for about 20 years and we've had 280 different crews um, over, over 1500 individuals have come to the station and two of those people have actually gone to space in fact one of them jessica watkins who went through our program in 2005 she is right now on the space station she's a nasa astronaut um, she's the first black woman to have a long-term stay on the space station and She's a alumni of our program, and we're very proud that, that, that she reached space. And we hope that more of the folks that have gone through our program get to go to space as well in the future. Um, this is actually the first station we built. This is called the Flashline Mars Arctic Research Station. We built this facility in the year 2000. And this is in Northern Canada. It's uh, very far north of Canada on an island called Devon Island. It's within the Arctic Circle. And um, we've sent crews here over the years several times. As you can imagine, it's a lot harder to get to this station up in the Arctic Circle than it is to get to the one in Utah. So we don't, we don't have crews here every year, um, but we are planning to send another crew possibly next summer, about a year from now. And the advantage of the Arctic is it's it's even more isolated than Utah. Um, it's literally you have to take a, you have to charter an airplane and land on the ice to to get there. But it's also um, like the Utah desert. It's a Mars analog. It's it's a this is a, in a place that is geologically similar to Mars. It's near an impact crater called Houghton Crater. Um, that people like to study because it has similarities to craters on Mars. And one of the areas of research up here in the Arctic is seeing how microorganisms and bacteria 
algae and lichen can survive in this extreme environment where it's really cold and there's not a lot of of, um, of organics. But um, so this has been a, this has been a successful program as well for us, and this is kind of how we got the ball rolling with Mars Analog Research, which now is like a worldwide field, and there's a lot of different stations out there beyond, beyond the two that we operate. Um, and then I wanted to talk a little bit about um, our virtual reality project, because what we've done with this is we've taken the, the station in Utah and we've made a digital twin of it. And we actually have a way for you to put on a virtual reality headset and explore Mars virtually, but also learn about what we do. Uh, at the Mars Society, what we do at the Mars Desert Research Station and go through some of the training that the crews have um, when they're getting acclimated to the campus. So um, this is actually available now. Uh, if, if you have a computer, you don't even have to have a VR headset. You just go to marsvr.com. We have a version of this that runs in a, in a normal web browser and you can explore the campus uh, that way. So this is a project I've actually been working on for five years. I'm really proud of this. Um, when we talk about like the far future, though, I just wanted to briefly talk a little bit about what we could do with Mars once we've explored it and once we've settled on it. We actually could also turn Mars into an Earth-like planet again, and that's the process called terraforming. And so the idea here would be that you're going to restore Mars's magnetic field and give it an atmosphere, you know, thicken its atmosphere with water ice, with, with water um, vapor and maybe some greenhouse gases that would be really bad on Earth, but that would do the trick on Mars and thicken its atmosphere and unlock some of the ice that's locked, the water that's locked away as ice under the surface. If you did this, if you gave Mars a magnetic field by maybe having uh, some type of metal plate in orbit around Mars. And if you imported a bunch of greenhouse gases and you warmed up the planet, then you basically would have a cycle happening that would turn Mars back into an Earth-like planet. And so um, we're not going to be around to see that. It's going to take about, you know, 100 years or more once the ball gets rolling. But it's possible to do this. And I think someday people will do this to make Mars an Earth-like planet again. And by doing this type of craft, by learning how to take a space environment that's not habitable by humans and turning it into one, that's like a craft I think we're gonna learn and use a lot in the future and make things like asteroids into space colonies. and really be able to um, settle a lot of different places. So, but it's gonna take all of us working together to do all this. And so, um, you know, I invite all of you to um, continue pursuing a career in STEM and, you know, keep thinking about Mars and, and seeing how um, you can help out uh, and certainly join the Mars Society and, and be part of what we're doing and, and see uh, how you can help out. Um, there's a lot of opportunities we have to talk to others about Mars and uh, we have things like a Mars Encyclopedia online and we have a, we're about to do a summer program to teach high schoolers about um, designing a Mars mission. And then we have our annual conference in uh, October. That's, we'll have a, it'll be available for people to watch online as well as being there in person. So. Um, so definitely invite you to, to be part of what we're doing and uh, it takes all of us working together to see this uh, positive human future as a reality. Uh, so with that, I'll, uh, I'll see if there's a, if anyone has any questions and it's been a real pleasure to talk with everybody today. Well, first thing first, thank you very much for such an amazing lecture. Very motivating. It yeah. gives us like the uh, these feelings to go and join uh, this uh, like innovative and creative type of mission. And also it gives us the motivation to be part of the humans that are going to be sent to Mars re like soon.
Well, dear students, if you have any questions, go ahead, raise your hand symbol in the app, and then you can ask all your questions to our dear, talented key speaker today. Actually, I was very, like, very intrigued when you have mentioned that you, you're like so, um, Mars Society, have sent the first woman to uh, to space, right? I mean, one of your crew members have been sent to space, or two. Um, so it was uh, one of our alumni at the program, uh, Jessica Watkins is her name. She she was a young woman. She was just out of college. She stayed at our station and she learned a lot about Mars. Then she went on to work on the rover team at JPL. She worked on the one of the rovers. And then she applied to become an astronaut with NASA and they accepted her. And so she got to learn how to be an astronaut and fly the fly the T-37 fighter plane and you know learn how like what what she would need to do to go to ISS. And then they selected her to go to the International Space Station. And she just launched a couple months ago, and now she's on the ISS. She's the first black woman to, oh, yeah. to have a long-term stay on the space station. Oh, that's um, a huge achievement. Yeah, we're really we're really proud of her, and we hope that she can speak at our conference from ISS. We're asking for that right now. Um, and there was another woman that that launched to space. That's an alumni of our program, Cyan Proctor who was on the Inspiration4 commercial mission with SpaceX. Um, there yeah. was four astronauts that, that went on that mission and she's also um, one of the people that went through our program. So we have two I, people that have gone to space from the Mars Society so far. Hopefully first of, first two of many. That that's, that's going to be like so motivating for and empowering to all of us here. I believe we have a question. Let me see in the chat box. Is there any similar what? Similar planet. Uh, is there any similar planet to Mars in this universe? Well, let's see. There, there are definitely some moons in our solar system that are Mars-like. Um, you know, when you talk about Mars, you're talking about there's natural gravity and there's a thin atmosphere. There's water. Um, there's other like elements that are you know interesting like you know different types of um, uh, um, what are they called rare earths like that we use to make electronics on Earth like that those are available on Mars so yeah there's actually a few moons of Jupiter and Saturn that are Mars like in those in those senses um, like one one moon that's really interesting to me is Europa it's a moon of Jupiter. And it has a liquid ocean, uh, but that there's a sort of ice crust around the planet. And so that would be a really good place to, to go explore with humans. Um, also, there's a moon of Saturn called Titan. And Titan is like an early version of Earth. It's, a, it's got a methane atmosphere. Yeah. Um, and so you, can, you could see like Titan would be a good place for humans to go and learn how to, how to, how to live there. Yes. So yeah, there's definitely other places in, in, just in our solar system that are interesting, that are similar to Mars in the sense that they could support humans. But um, yeah. And there is another question from Samira. He said, how much month <laughs> it takes to go to Mars? Can you guess? Where yeah, I, I can tell you. I don't have to guess. I can tell you exactly what it is. So yeah. if, if you have traditional chemical the ones that we use today that are that use different um, chemicals to generate the rocket burn, um, you know, that we've used to go to the moon, that we've used for the like the space shuttle and SpaceX rockets, that type of rocket would take about six to nine months to get to Mars um, based on which trajectory you used to go from Earth to Mars and, and where Mars and Earth were aligned. So if you're going to talk about sending people to Mars and bringing them back using chemical propulsion, which is the technology we have today, then it's about a three year mission to go to Mars and back. So you, you know, you'd send a, a crew to Mars. They take about six to nine months to get there. Then they'd stay on Mars for a year. They'd wait for the window to open back up between Earth and Mars so that Earth and Mars were in the right. 
alignment to send to go home and then you'd send the crew back another six to nine months so it's about you know you add those up it's about a year it's about three years about two and a half years three years so um but if you had uh different more advanced forms of propulsion like if you had a nuclear reactor on your spacecraft and you could use you could basically use solar pr electric propulsion with the nuclear reactor the advantage there is that you could you could run the rocket longer you're not burning fuel for a short amount of time you're using solar propulsion over a long period of time and that would actually only be a three-month trip to get to mars if you did that approach um, okay. but we don't have functioning yeah. nuclear rockets today we yeah. have to go design and build that so it's possible but it, they don't exist yet um, yeah. But that is probably something that we would ultimately do in the next couple decades is build a nuclear thermal propulsion rocket. So you use solar electric propulsion rather, and um, that would shorten the trip. And then you can think about things like like what they have on Star Trek, like the warp drive, you know, <laughs> where you have, like, yeah. a, a, you have and, and we've taught like the concept that is there, right, of, yeah. of matter and antimatter reacting yes. together and 100 yes. percent energy is released like that's we know like physics wise that's possible but we've never okay. actually done that we've never demonstrated that in the lab <laughs> but it, it like you could see a future where people figure out how to work with antimatter and create antimatter and use it for propulsion and yes. you put a warp bubble around the spacecraft and then sort of fold space you know, and then you're kind of getting into science fiction stuff, but it, that stuff is based in reality. It is based in real concepts of physics, you know, yeah. and so you could see if there if there was a way to sort of warp space around your spacecraft and accelerate it that way, like that would sort sort um, shorten the trip, certainly. Um, and then the last thing are wormholes, which again, we don't have a wormhole today. There's no wormhole I can push a button and go through and I'm on the other side of the solar system like you see in movies like Interstellar or Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Yeah. Um, a wormhole that they could go to the other side of the galaxy with. And it was a permanent wormhole. Um, there's nothing, we, we've never discovered anything like that, but the concept is there in physics. Like you, you could sort of take two points in space and fold space and create this little bridge between the two and then just go through it and then you're all, all of a sudden on the other side of the solar system or the other side we of the need, galaxy like that's we need to call dr strange for some like uh, advanced techniques <laughs> yeah i mean i think I, I you know you're right we we need we just need someone from the future to tell us how to do it because they've, yeah. they've already figured it out so <laughs> i believe we will, we will attend this type of uh, like evolu evolutionary type of thinking um, like comparing what we have already had with what we have experienced today, we see humanity and also technology are both evolving. So I believe soon we are going to see some amazing, like magical type of like creative type of like technology. I believe Absara, she's, yeah, Absara, go ahead. You have a question? Thank you so much for the amazing lecture today. Uh, I have two questions. My first question is regarding the Mars simulation projects. So there are so much Mars simulation projects ongoing on Earth, but when we are actually going to study it on Mars, we might be face troubles cause in here, we have mixed layers, continental drifts, uh, plate techniques, uh, mostly natural and human contaminated areas. But in Mars compared to the Earth, Mars is still in its prehistoric structure, mostly. So how we are going to overcome these troubles when we are going to study the Mars? That's my first question. Okay. Um, so I'm not sure what troubles you mean. Like you, you mentioned that Earth has plate tectonics. Um, Mars actually has seismic activity as well. Uh, Mars well, Mars does not have a rotating iron core like we do, so Mars doesn't have a magnetic field. But there are elements of Mars that have that create seismic activity that we don't fully understand yet. But the recent mission called Insight that went to Mars a few years back has measured Mars quakes, 
So we actually know that there is seismic activity on Mars. Now, it's nothing crazy like a huge earthquake that would, you know, that, that we have to worry about on Earth that's going to cause a lot of damage. I don't think there's going to be anything like that. But there are definitely, like, there is definitely activity on Mars that, that you know, of, like, continental plates bumping together that we don't fully understand yet. I hope that answered your question. I'm not sure if it did. Thank you. Thank you so much. My second question is why are we using some, if we are going to use perseverance or, uh, what, or any kind of orbit, why are we use country names and institute names? Why can't we use the specific uh, term like Earth, perseverance from Earth? Because in here we are still facing some divisions country wise nation wise and yeah. religion wise so why are we using those flags and if we are going to people in mass we have to reject all those things as i know so why are we using still these country names flags and everything because hey, i don't I want to be mass like earth another earth so sure yeah, no, that's a great point. I mean, and, and you, you can see behind me, I have a flag here. And this is a flag of any country. This is a flag of Mars. And it's it's meant to symbolize the future human civilization on Mars. And we have actually, we actually have this flag flying at our analog stations. And a version of this flag has been to space on the space shuttle and this in, sp in the space station. And so, yeah, I definitely agree with you. We should not think of going to Mars as the accomplishment of one country or one team. It should be a human, humans are doing it together. And whenever the first crew does go, I think the whole world is going to be proud of them. And we should kind of think of it more as we're sending representatives from all of humanity to Mars, not just from one country or, or one company like SpaceX. But, you know, unfortunately, the reality is, you know, human beings are still tribal people. And, you know, if you know, there's no there's no current mission to Mars. But if, for example, if there was NASA funding for Mars today and they were preparing to send a mission to Mars, they would probably fly the U.S. flag who's funding it. But it doesn't have to be the the end of, you know, it doesn't it doesn't mean there can't be more international cooperation and uh, more people represented. Um, and I definitely, like at the Mars Society, we try to be, we try to ha be more inclusive and think of things in a global context more. And so, I, yeah, I completely agree with the mindset of your question. I think we all should explore Mars together as humanity, not as individual people from different countries. I agree 100%. This question was just amazing. And your answer is just like, humanitarian <laughs> so i will invite samira also samira go ahead ask your question if somehow if somehow humans go to the mass and uh, what about the radiation in the mass yeah that's a really good question samira so there is a little bit of a radiation risk going into space. Um, there's two types of radiation in space. There's cosmic rays and solar flares. Um, those are the two ki kinds of radiation you have to be, you have to really watch out for when you're in space, whenever you leave the Earth and whenever you're beyond the Earth's magnetic field, which protects us from a lot of that. Um, cosmic rays are essentially coming in from all over the universe. They're they're from supernova of stars and they're very small particles that are going very fast. And so there's really no defense against cosmic rays, but what you can do is like not be exposed to them as much. So when we're sitting here on Earth, when we're you know standing on the surface of Earth, Earth is actually shielding us from all the cosmic rays coming at us from the from below. So it's shielding us from that. Um, but there's still cosmic rays coming in from above. When you're out in space and you're not orbiting Earth, if you're going between Earth and Mars on a spacecraft, well, you're going to get hit from cosmic rays from all directions. So you need, you know, you need to take that into account with the design of, of your spacecraft and, and the protection you have. Um, and when you're back, when you're on Mars, same thing, you kind of need a little bit of radiation protection to, to prevent that. 
solar flares are different though. Solar flares come from the sun. And so a uh, solar flare is essentially, you know, some plasma or gas coming out of the sun unpredictably that goes out into space. And if you were in a spacecraft between Earth and Mars and and, and one of those hits your spacecraft, it could be very detrimental to the human beings there. But there are ways to shield from a, a solar flare. You know, you can basically take, um, you know, either some like iron plating, metal plating, or you could take things like food and water and use those as shields. If you had a, a few feet of thickness between you and the solar flare, you know, you and outside the spacecraft, that would probably be enough. And so most spacecraft are designed to have a solar flare shelter in the middle of them that people could go into for a brief period of time when the solar flare is is coming into contact with their spacecraft. But when you're on the surface of Mars, you also will need to worry about that because there's not a magnetic field and, and thick atmosphere to protect you. So usually the concepts for bases will have a solar flare shelter or they'll, or they'll, or they'll automatically have a lot of radiation shielding as part of the design of the base. Um, there's also a little bit of radiation you're going to get just being on the surface of Mars. And so, you know, that's not really well understood yet, but we are we, we, we are assuming that you're, you're not going to be able to like be out in a spacesuit for months at a time on Mars. You're going to need to go out for short duration EVAs and then go back into the habitat and be safe. And so that's usually the mission plans that we design or take that into account. So, so radiation is, it's so a bottom line, radiation is a risk on Mars and in space, but it is something that's solvable. Well, good. I will invite right now Sanuki. Sanuki, go ahead. Okay, uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for this uh, amazing lecture. Like, actually, I felt I was like in all mass. Um, You're very welcome. Uh, so my question is, uh, will man manage to create technologies that will leave planet Earth uh, like and go to other planets not except Mars and uh, can we even leave the solar system and go to reach other planetary systems also? Yeah, so the technologies that were developed Mars could be used to, to visit other places in our solar system. Like I mentioned earlier, like the moons of Jupiter and Saturn are interesting destinations. Certainly our Earth's, the Earth's moon, like that's probably the first place we should go back to. And there's an active NASA program right now called Artemis that's planning a return to the moon with the SLS system. And SpaceX is also modifying their starship to land on the moon. And so all that should happen. We should use the same technology that we're going to use to visit Mars to go visit the moon and some of the other um, moons of, the, of, of Jupiter and Saturn that are interesting. Um, so that's all doable. That's all, you know, we're going to see that in the next 20 years. We, but when you talk about going to another star, that's a whole different problem. You know, Say we wanted to send a probe to Alpha Centauri, which is the closest star to the sun. Um, it's, it's about a light year and a half away. And so um, you're not gonna be able to, to take a Starship rocket and go to Alpha Centauri. That would take thousands of years with chemical propulsion. You're gonna need some of those newer concepts we talked about, like the warp drive, uh, to do something like that, or the wormhole to do something like that. But there are concepts not to send humans to Alpha Centauri, but to send small probes, like nanoscale probes, that you could use light, or you could use solar sails or other concepts to propel them uh, over a long period of time and get to Alpha Centauri generation, get, get there in like 30 to 40 years. So that's that's doable with today's time, and there are there are some teams and organizations working on that, such as the the Breakthrough Propulsion Project, um, the 100 Year Starship Project. So there there are some there is some work being done on that, 
I wouldn't hold your breath, though. I don't think we're going to see a human mission to Alpha Centauri anytime soon, but I think it's a great thing to think about. Mm -hmm. Well, I will right now invite Parami. Go ahead. Ask your question. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It was amazing. Uh, in the presentation, uh, you said that to warm up Mars, we could set off some nuclear bombs, but wouldn't it damage it? Yeah, I mean, that that's one idea that folks have had, like, we're, you're talking now about terraforming and what you would need to do to make Mars like Earth um, to thicken its atmosphere. And yeah, one of the things you would need to do is warm it up. And you could, you could do that a lot of different ways. Um, you know, nuclear bombs would be one way. Certainly, you'd need to be kind of responsible about that. You wouldn't want to set those off anywhere near a human settlement. Um, and yeah, they would cause probably some damage depending on how you did it um, to the to the ground. But you know, there are there are ways to sort of humanely do that to to just try to warm up the atmosphere. There's some concepts there, but that's not the only approach you could take to warm up Mars. And one another thing you could do um, is you could crash uh, an asteroid or a comet into Mars. Although that would cause damage too. So if you're worried about damage, it's probably not a good plan. You also could introduce um, species of lichen and algae to Mars that could slowly warm up the atmosphere by producing um, uh, thicker gases like oxygen. Um, that, that would also be a way to warm up Mars. So there's a lot of different options there. We don't have to li literally send off, set off nuclear bombs. Well, thank you so much. I have another uh question from the comment box by Dihara. He said, I would like make a, reduce it to one question. He actually asking if we are be successful to send humans to Mars, those humans sent to colonize Mars, their lifestyle will be different. Is this proven? Is this like? Oh, yeah. Like, I think, right. yeah, I think their, their lifestyle would definitely be different and, and with what we practice in our analog station in Utah and the Arctic, we're kind of already seeing what it would be like to, to live on Mars. It's it's basically a lifestyle where you're 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 juggling a lot of things. You're juggling your the the keeping your facility online. You're making sure that you have power and and water and food and everything you need to survive. Like that's going to be a constant struggle of just like making sure the lights are on, making sure that you have enough food, that your food is growing or you're receiving cargo deliveries from Earth. Um, your water, you're, you're generating water out of the, the ice on Mars or you're pulling atmosphere in and generating methane. Like keeping those machines running is mm -hmm. going to be a major task for the people that are there. But also... You don't, you don't go to Mars to just sit around and do nothing. You go to Mars to try to accomplish something, you know, science-wise. Like, there's a lot of discoveries that are yet to be made on Mars. We can even discover life on Mars if we drill for water. It's possible that there's still um, organic life on Mars, like molecular-based life on Mars um, from, the, from the distant past. Like, I believe that. You know, I, I believe that because Mars was once warm and wet like the Earth, it's very possible that life arose there. And it could be that life arose on Mars first and then migrated to Earth through asteroid impacts. Um, that's another concept that to me seems pretty viable. So if you're living on Mars, one of the things you're going to do is explore and look for things, look for scientific discoveries and look for evidence of past life and evidence of present life even. Um, but you're also going to be scouting out Mars for future human crews. You're going to be looking, you know, going to new areas and trying to see um, what what else is viable for a settlement. And you're going to be building infrastructure. So there's 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 going to be no lack of things to do when you're on Mars. It's not going to be a chill, quiet lifestyle. There's going to be a lot of work. So the people that go to Mars are going to be hard workers that, you know are doing things all the time and juggling a lot of things. And that's kind of kind of how we operate at the Mars Society. We operate very similar to that. We all, like I juggle a lot of things. 
all day long and different activities and go ahead sorry i said great things you are yes. like you're managing great things and creating also a new vision and as we have another comment it seems that uh, tisari she is a little bit anxious <laughs> She actually shared a picture about the future on moon, which is like looks we have like some solar panels there and we have future of Mars. Also, it looks like we have some good uh, habitats for humans there. And she shared also future of Earth with a fire on forests. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I hope I hope that's not the future we're headed for the sorry. I hope the future Earth is more positive than that. But it is, you know, it is true that there's a lot of things to worry about on Earth with climate change and, you know, people abusing the Earth and not really being good stewards of our planet. And I, I, I feel like this is just a phase we're going through as humanity and that we're it's kind of an adolescent phase and we're going to get our stuff together and, and, and try to take care of the planet better. And one of the reasons to go explore space is to understand the Earth better. It's to understand, like, if you look at comparative planetology, if you look at Mars and Venus and some of the moons of Saturn and Jupiter as variants of Earth and how they got that way, maybe you can understand Earth a little bit better and how we can save Earth and be better stewards of the Earth. And that's what I believe. And uh, I'm sure that Isari was with us last time when our uh, uh, previous key uh, speaker, she mentioned that going to Mars could be the solution for uh, like peace in Earth. So Tisari, let's just hope for the best. <laughs> so we have also Oshada. Oshada, go ahead. Ask your question, dear. Yeah, ma'am. Uh, firstly, thanks for a great lecture. Uh, my uh, question is, uh, uh, radiation uh, and magnetic field directly uh, affect to nerve system and other uh, body system. So uh, what are the, the practical researches for uh, live and uh, survive with mass magnetic field and uh, not mass magnetic field? Uh, mag uh, radiation to uh, astronauts uh, in Arctic. So I'm not really sure. Could you repeat your question a bit? I, I think what you're asking is what are, what are the challenges of, of dealing with radiation? Ushada, your question is not that much quite clear. If you can just repeat it, please, or write it in the comment box. Ah. Yeah. Uh, direct, uh, mainly, uh, I asked uh, radiation, uh, radiation and uh, not mm -hmm. magnetic field. So uh, mainly effect to nerve system. So uh, how to survive with uh, uh, astronauts in uh, this environment? Okay, how, how do you protect so, astronauts from radiation? That's your question. Astronauts in Earth. Ah, in the Arctic type of. Um, so he asked, like, you have shared with us the Arctic type of like mission, and mm -hmm. he asked if there is how we can like study these impact on them in Earth. If if the, I did understand the question, because it seems that the network is not that much good. Yeah, let me just. I'll make a couple points um, about radiation and um, protecting humans from it. I mean, it's 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 not really possible to test fully what Mars radiation is going to be like here on Earth in the Arctic, for example. It's different. Um, there's not really an environment on Earth that has as much radiation as Mars to do a, a test like that. Um, so we don't necessarily need ex extra protection in the Arctic for radiation. There is a little bit of an increased risk from being in the Arctic because the magnetic field is less, but it's nothing. It's not. It's it's not a. It's not significant, right? Um, you actually get more radiation from flying in an airplane sometimes than that. Um, so 
but the way to protect people on Mars from the radiation is to have shielding from, from it. So um, whether that's building your base underground so that there's rocks between you and uh, the, the radiation, um, or if you had padding on your, your buildings, um, mm. radiation shielding built into the buildings, there's certainly going to be like new materials designed and developed that help with this. But the way we would do it to thicker padding and having things like, you know, water be part of that to, to shield from the radiation. Well, thank you so much for this amazing session of discussion. I believe we have reached the end of this lecture today. Oh, we still have questions. <laughs> Let me see in the comment box. By the way, I will invite Dr. Arvinda if he can comment today a lecture session. And uh, Dr. Arvinda, go ahead. Open your microphone, please. Dr. Arvinda? Yes, Jada. Yeah. Um, first, uh, I really appreciate what uh, James doing, and I think I'm audible. Yeah, we can yeah. hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hear it's you. clear because of there are some of network issue. And first, uh, I'm highly appreciate what uh, James trying to doing because of since last uh, few years, she doing some he doing something like where we extraordinary work uh, with the mass society. Even though we noticed at the last year, uh, there are huge crew, like uh, there are huge participations and all the things have to be managed with the uh, James and the best thing what I noticed with the mass society, they are trying to do something like a realistic work. That's the most important thing better than the phenomenal way and then uh, people understanding it very clearly and then after that people can think something more than curiosity. Because the people are curious, so just ignore the curious and then see some of like uh, realistic things, innovation, what we can do and go to the mass. That is the best uh, thing what I noticed from the uh, mass society and the games. And finally, uh, I wish very all the best for their future work and games in the mass society. And thank you very much, James, having you here. Yeah, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you so much. Well, returning to Nikit, he said, or oh, wait, if one day somehow we cover, we convert the red planet to a blue one from water, it is essentially to maintain a water cycle. How could we do such from the thin atmosphere on Mars? How could we from White, how could we for clothes on Mars? You guys yeah. need to check my glasses. <laughs> yeah, um, it's a good question. So essentially what we're talking about again is terraforming and to do this, to do this act of turning Mars from a, a red planet to a blue planet, what you would have to do is give it a magnetic field because that would hold in the atmosphere. If you just stick in the atmosphere and there's no magnetic field on Mars, it's just going to blow away. The solar wind is just going to slowly blow that away. So you need the magnetic field to hold the atmosphere in. That's what. That's how the Earth works. Is our we have a rotating iron core of the planet, and that creates this huge magnetic field, protects us from radiation, and holds the atmosphere in. So if you did that, if you had a magnetic field on Mars again, and you start thickening the atmosphere by warming up the planet, maybe introducing some greenhouse gases, but, but unlocking the water that's locked in, into the surface now as ice and sublimating that into the air, then you would have clouds. You, you wouldn't have a thin atmosphere anymore. You, you would have a thick atmosphere and you would have water clouds just like we have on Earth. And you would have a water cycle just like we have on Earth. So that's really the key is you need the magnetic field. Well, thank you very much for this amazing session. Thank you very much for your time and also for all the achievements you had like achieved with your team. Oh. Sending you all our like best wishes for more other uh, excellent achievements. And thank you again for accepting uh, our invitation. And we are very honored to have you. Thank you, everybody, for your attendance and have a nice evening, everybody.
wishing you an epic weekend. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. I wish Thank everyone you. the best. Good luck, and I'll see Thank you on you. Mars. <laughs> see ya. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, man. Thank you, sir. Good night. Good night, sir. Good night. Each one of you. Thank you, dears. Good night.